For those that may be uh, new or visiting, I'm Paul Kramer. I'm an elder here in the house at Sojourn. So as most of us know, at this point, uh, as Christians, um, we're engaged in a war. And uh, uh, Kelly's going to talk more about that as we go. It's not a war that's over there somewhere. It's right here in our backyard. It's in our doorstep. And it's not so much about right or left or Democrat or Republican or conservative or liberal, but at the root, it's about ideology, theology, and the uh, spiritual worldview that's going to dominate our culture. We each have a role in this war. We have our own personal, individual battles. We pray and then we act. Prayer is a prelude to action. God's, we're plan A. God doesn't really have a plan B, so we, we pray and then we act. Uh, in this battle... God's raised up some major artillery pieces, and First Liberty is certainly one of those heavy-duty pieces and a major force in the legal arena. In the past, in the recent past, uh, Sojourn has enjoyed a relationship with and supported First Liberty. So we're very honored and privileged to welcome back uh, once again uh, the founder of First Liberty, Mr. Kelly Shackelford. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I, you know, I always enjoy coming to Sojourn uh, and love Sojourn mainly because I feel so loved at Sojourn uh, uh, more than I don't know any place I can think of uh, that I come and just feel so loved and supported. Um, I am, you know, it, you. I said this in the earlier service, uh, what Paul said he had prepared, and he didn't know what I was going to say, And uh, but it's just interesting how the Lord works. Um, I find that the Lord kind of wraps our messages together before we even know it, because my plan was to come out here and to say nothing and start reading this scripture, which is, to everything there is a season, to every purpo- purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate a time of war, and a time of peace. And I wanted to read that because uh, I wanted to start out by saying, I think we all know we're in a time of war. Um, and again, you know, that, that's what the Lord put on Paul's heart. Uh, reconfirms that when I pray, Lord, give me the message you want me to give. Uh, if that's part of the message. It's obviously not that we're taking up, you know, weapons uh, in our country, but we are... We are in a battle for our country right now and who we are going to be and whether our culture is going to honor um, the Judeo-Christian principles it was built upon or whether we're turning to something completely different. And uh, the reason this matters, I'll show a video in a little bit, maybe explain a little more, but uh, we tend as Christians think that, um, and this is real susceptible throughout the churches. That, you know, we'll just deal with our church stuff. We don't really need to deal with the government stuff that's going on. And it's like they forget what incredible evil can be done under government. You know, I mean, go back and look at the concentration camps. I took my kids, we visited the concentration camps. I mean, it's, it's the unspeakable evil when government is in control without the sort of Judeo Christian uh, moorings that hold government to its proper role. Um, so we have a responsibility, not just in the church, but out of the church and not even just to share the gospel, which is important, but also with our government. And the message that I felt the Lord really on my heart for you guys today was that this battle that we're in is not about, and we tend to think this about the big people, the important people, the powerful people. Uh, whether it's the president or whatever. God will use all those people. But this, real, this cultural battle is about regular people like you and like me. And that's when I do my update today of what's happening at the front lines, um, that's what we're going to see. It's all these regular people. And so I just want us to understand that this battle, the future is really in our hands and how faithful we are. 
So now let me step back because some of you know who I am and what my group is and some you know, it might be new. First Liberty is the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom in the United States. So if you're Giovanni Rubio and you're a nine-year-old boy and you're told you can bring any book you want to school today during free reading time until you bring your Bible. And then you're told you can't read religious books while you're at school. And you're a poor family. You live outside of Miami-Dade. I mean, you can't get a legal team to represent you and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we come in at First Liberty. We represent them. We bring the best lawyers in the country. They donate their time. We represent them free of charge so that we win. We don't just win as we did for Giovanni and his family, but we set a precedent that protects your children, your grandchildren, my children, my grandchildren. And that's why we're here. I mean, even a person with resources probably couldn't say, well, you know, this Bible thing's so important that I'm going to spend all my retirement or all my whatever fighting for this. So that's why we do what we do. How did I get involved? Back when I was in uh, high school, I knew my gifts were in analytical thinking and speaking, and I thought, well, I either need to be a pastor or a lawyer. And people said, that's a God or Satan choice, isn't it? A pastor or a lawyer. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I analyzed my DNA and realized I would probably be better at dispensing justice rather than mercy, and so I'd probably make a better lawyer than a pastor. Uh, I probably didn't have some of the pastor gifts that I needed to have uh, uh, to do that. And so I went to law school, and you know my intelligence scores and my grades undergrad were, were good, but for a law student, I should have been an average law student. And really, I find myself spending all my time at my church doing the discipleship group because I have a heart for you know discipling college students. And this is not something, this is really a bad plan, right? The average intelligence, average whatever at law school where people spend 24-7 studying their law and uh, competing, and I'm doing this other thing. And, but when the grades came back, I was making high grades, which made no sense. And it was just the Lord's way to show me, I want you to, to keep your heart for ministry, but I want you to do law. And so I got out, I clerked for a federal judge for a year. Uh, you sort of research and write opinions and help the judge, but it's a unique one year thing because you get to know what it looks like to be on the other side of the bench. Sort of what what things look like, you know, what's over the line, what's persuasive, what's not, those kind of things. And uh, so after that one year, all the law firms give you really nice offers to come and work at their law firm because you have a unique perspective that most people won't won't ever get. And I sat in my office and I just thought, oh Lord. I just feel like I'd suffocate if I went and did that regular law thing. I just don't feel like that's what I'm being called to do. And I remember thinking to myself, I said, well, what do you want to do? I thought, well, you know, I'd love to use my legal skills. Um, I feel like the Lord showed me I should do that, but I want to help pastors and churches and religious freedoms and their founding principles, and I'd even like to go to seminary part-time if I could. And I laughed because there was, you know, no job like that in the United States that paid you to do that. And... Uh, about two weeks later, two guys called me. I'd never met these guys. They were big law firms. And they, they said, will you go to lunch? And I said, sure. And they said, look, we've started donating our time for religious freedom. We're now getting so many calls, it's hurting our ability to make a living. So we were wondering, would you be willing to come on, do legal cases, help pastors, churches, religious freedoms, and our founding principles? And you can even go to seminary part-time if you want to. <laughs> now, being in my young 20s, mid-20s, or whatever, maybe I was a little immature in my faith. I said, let me pray about it. Like, that wasn't an answer to prayer. And the next morning, I said, I think that was an answer to prayer, and I said, yes, and these guys uh, said, how much you making, uh, how much you need to live on, and I was making 28000 as a federal clerk, uh, and so uh, they started pitching in out of their pocket every month to get me started. Uh, and 29 years and four months later, First Liberty is now the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom in the United States. So... It's, it's really one of those God stories. I could have never predicted we were going to have the need that we have now for this kind of help. Um, and, uh, and I thought a good way to start would be, why is this important? Why is religious freedom important? Now, you, a lot of people in this room probably get it immediately. You probably know, you think, you know what? There's no hope for this country turning around if people don't hear the truth and that truth doesn't redeem them and set them free and, tur and turn their lives around. A revival is what we need in this country to turn things around. Uh, and that's true. But even for people who aren't people of faith, religious freedom is crucial. That's right. And um, I want to explain why by showing you a video of a guy who's a supporter of ours 
who's not a person of faith, uh, but who grew up in Czechoslovakia and saw firsthand. And uh, so I want you to see his story, and then uh, we'll talk about this real quick, of why this is so important. If somebody uh, told us that we were going to be crawling through barbed wire fences and escaping and moving across the ocean to America, everybody would have said, that's absolutely silly, that'll never happen. If they'd caught, let's say, a politician who opposed them, they put him on trial, but the evidence might have been presented, but you know the outcome was a foregone conclusion. So they had total control of you. That's how the dictatorship is run. My father was, first of all, uh, very patriotic, had uh, strong beliefs in democracy. The people that he helped were, if not friends, very good acquaintances. He knew they were going to get killed. So when he got arrested, my mother got arrested and my brother, who was eight years older, got arrested. So my whole family, except me, were in jail. Uh, then my father would, would have been executed, but my mother managed to bribe the judge. He got sent to concentration camp in lieu of that, where he was, you know, beaten, and not fed. I mean, basically tortured. As soon as he escaped, his name was on the radio all the time. And as one of the most wanted people, there was a secret service sitting in our front hallway all the time. As you study history, one needs to be vigilant all the time because you cannot take anything for granted. When uh, you start losing freedoms, it is more than likely that it'll keep on chipping away. The opportunities we have, the ability to express yourself and do whatever you want to do and be able to achieve uh, things without being blocked are unparalleled. The political correctness is, is, is ridiculous. I mean, it, it is going too far. The defending the ability to have crosses or Christmas decorations just is getting to a point of absurdity. When I think about uh, what was happening in Czechoslovakia at that time, there are parallels because I think Anytime you start taking away people's freedom, it just goes on. And you must take guard in the early stages as opposed to wait and let it all collapse when it's too late. Nobody expected communism in Czechoslovakia when it happened. It happened. Again, Peter was a guy actually who came up to me after a talk and uh, said, you know, I'm not a person of faith. I don't believe like you do. Um, but I think that what you guys are doing is the most important thing that anybody is doing in this country. He said, because I saw this happen in my country. They took the religious symbols down. They put up secular symbols. And within months, we all lost our political freedoms. And he handed me a check for $5,000. And he said, I'm going to be supporting you from now on. And this is a guy that doesn't even know Jesus. Um, he just understands the connection to our freedoms. And our founders, this is why they called a religious freedom our first freedom, because they understood if you lose that freedom, you'll lose all your freedoms. The one thing that totalitarianism will never allow are citizens who hold an allegiance to one higher than the government. So whenever that type of government comes in, the flashpoint, the first flashpoint is always religious freedom. And if that falls, everything falls. So that's why we fight so hard for this. So, I mean, that being the case, how are we doing? Well, it probably doesn't surprise you that the attacks are greater than I've ever seen. And I think most of you know that. Um, we do a little uh, summary every year of all the attacks uh, that we can find on religious freedom. This is the one that we just did, I guess, three weeks ago for this last year. And, uh, I mean, it's like five a page. It's everything from... You know, the, the, there's been more than one case now of pastors actually having their sermons subpoenaed by the government. 
okay? Including one in Texas. Um, we had the other one, which was in uh, Georgia. And uh, I mean, literally the government ordering churches and pastors to hand over copies of their sermons to the government by threat of court, uh, or you can be put in jail. Uh, something that you thought you might see in Czechoslovakia or in Nazi Germany, but not in the United States. I mean, uh, we have uh, there. One of our newer cases is a case with a uh, uh, a woman who lives in government housing who was told by the police, ordered by the police, that she was not allowed to pray in her own home. And we're, I mean, we're still having to fight this case uh, on appeal. Um, so the the stuff that we're fighting for is stuff you couldn't even imagine, right? That you. You can't even make up. Uh, I think of the senior citizens who were told that their, their meals are going to be taken away because they were praying over their meals and they were federally funded. And if you pray over federally funded meals, they said that would violate separation of church and state. So we're going to take your meals away. So the stuff, you, you, you can, and you can look at this online anytime we've got, where you can click on it uh, and just look through the examples uh, at firstliberty.org. What you realize quickly is how pervasive the problem is and how it's everywhere. It's in every community. It's every age. It's every scenario of life. Uh, there's nowhere you can really avoid uh, you know, running into this. So I thought, what's a quick way to update you? Because... Um, you know, there, there's four, we had 400 and something, 434, I think it was, or whatever, legal matters last year. It's like, I obviously can't tell you about all those, but I'll just do a couple of quick areas of update. One is in the workplace. This is really important because if, if we lose our religious freedoms in the workplace, that, I mean, number one, that's where you spend most of your waking hours. But number two, if they control where your paycheck is controlled, then they, they control your ability to even feed your family. And so uh, I, last time I was here, I know I showed you the video, I think, of uh, Aaron and Melissa Klein, who ran a bakery, a, you know, Christians, and they wanted their bakery run in accordance to honoring Christ. And one of the things they did is they made wedding cakes, but Melissa was real specific. She did interviews with the, uh, the people who were getting married, and she wanted to really make the cake special and unique for them. And they had a lesbian couple come and say, we'd like to buy some of your baked goods. And they said, oh, we'd love to, you know, to sell them to you. And they love these women. And then they said, we'd like you to do our wedding cake. And they said, oh, I'm sorry we can't do that because of our faith and what we believe about marriage. But just right down the street here is a place that'll do that, no problem, and they'll do a great job. The next thing they know, the state of Oregon's coming after them. Uh, they were fined $135,000. Uh, their business has been bankrupted now. Uh, and they were ordered uh, not to speak publicly their beliefs about marriage. Um, that case uh, is still ongoing. Uh, as I mentioned last year, you know, we were uh, going to be filing it to the, the Court of Appeals, which we did, and we don't have a decision yet. We're waiting. So these attacks on, in the workplace are still going on, but it's not just employers, it's employees. It's, uh, you know, everybody who works, we're having to defend these things. It's, it's so crazy that one of our most recent cases is uh, a woman who was actually told that she could not speak to a, a co-worker who went to her church and say the words, I'll be praying for you. That was, quote, unprofessional, they said, and put a letter in her file. Now, some of you think, oh, you're making that up. So I brought a video. I want you to see the real person. Prayer is important to me because I've seen it work. I've seen prayer change people's lives. I've had it change my own life. When I first first called into the meeting and I was told that offering to pray for somebody was unprofessional and that I could lose my job, I was shocked and I was fearful. I live in the United States of America. I don't live in North Korea. I don't live in Russia. After Tony had a private conversation with a colleague at work in which she told her friend that she's praying for him, she was called down to the office, and later she was given a coaching memorandum in which she was told that she had violated the Constitution by telling a friend at work that she was praying for him. I've had experiences where I can't imagine going through life without people praying for me, encouraging me, and lifting me up. So when someone comes to me and they share something, a hardship, it's probably the first thing I do go to. 
The Supreme Court has been very clear on this. It has said that neither students nor teachers shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gate. When you're a teacher, you arrive at school early and you're often there very late. And when the students aren't there, we get together and we talk and we share things. When I get to know somebody, especially when I know that they share my faith, when they're sharing problems, struggles, or situations, it's a natural reflex for me to encourage them by offering to pray for them. No one should be threatened with being fired from their job for simply telling a coworker privately that I'm praying for you. The Constitution is clear. It protects teachers like Tony when they reference their faith in a private conversation at work. If this can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. I want to be able to feel comfortable where I work, with who I am, and I want my coworkers to be able to be comfortable with who they are. When word got around that Tony had been reprimanded for having a private conversation and referencing her faith at work, other teachers began to censor themselves as well. But that's not what the First Amendment permits. The First Amendment protects the right of all teachers and the students to be able to reference their faith in private conversations at work and at school. The school district here needs to send an important and clear message to its employees that it will defend your right to have a private conversation at work referencing your faith. I'm scared to think that our country could be in a situation where religious liberties like mine could be suppressed. We need organizations like First Liberty to champion this cause. At First Liberty Institute, we are committed to defending the rights of people like Tony to be able to reference their faith at work without fear of losing their job. Now, the good news is uh, we've had a number of these cases uh, so far uh, in, in regarding the workplace over the past, I don't know, two or three years where we really tried to focus on this because we knew how important it was when we saw the attacks coming. And every case that is over uh, has been a victory. Um, so that's the good news is, but we're having to fight, uh, you know, even for the right to tell a coworker who goes to your church, I'll be praying for you. Um, the second area I thought that would be a great area to update you on is the schools. And, you know, there's a lot of examples I could give you, but I think the best example, which I think a lot of people are familiar, is the Coach Kennedy case. And, uh, of course, Coach Kennedy is a guy who was in the Marines for 20 years, came out, watched that movie uh, the night before his first day on the job as a coach, that movie Facing the Giants, which is a Christian movie about Christian coaches, and it just convicted him. And he, he made a promise to God. He said... You know, after every game, when we go to the middle of the field and we shake the hands of the other coaches and all that, I, I'm going to go to a knee and I'm going to give thanks to you for the privilege of coaching these young men. And so that's what he did for seven years until the school told him, if you go to a knee, we're going to fire you. And uh, a lot of people haven't seen the uh, backstory uh, to the Coach Kennedy case. And I wanted to show you this. I don't, I don't even know if we've shown this publicly very much at all. But I want to show you this because, again, this is the theme I'm telling you that this battle that's going on, it's not a bunch of important people, the, the powerful people. It's people like Tony Richardson who you just saw. It's people like Coach Kennedy. And as you see from his background, he's not like the, the, you know, the church leader or the whatever. He's just the regular person like you and me who God said, will you be faithful? So let's look at uh, Coach Kennedy's background. When I was a kid, I had a kind of real rough childhood. I grew up in Bremerton, Washington, so right there in my hometown. And I was adopted into a family that couldn't have kids. And a few years later, they ended up being able to have kids. So they really didn't need us anymore. And I felt kind of abandoned from that and really started acting out really angry, kind of person and got into a lot of trouble and I was kicked out of my house. I was one of those runaways. I was always getting in fights. I was one of those bad kids that you really didn't want to be around and ended up, you know, jumping in and out of group homes and foster homes and uh, boys homes. So I had a real rough time growing up and really just something that uh, most people shouldn't ever have to go through. It wasn't that I was mad at God. I really never gave him a second thought. It was really, uh, the, as far as I consider, a true atheist that 
I was like, there's nothing after you die. And I went 20 years in the Marine Corps with that kind of mentality. Being somebody that was angry and wanted to prove that what everybody was saying wasn't true about me, you know, saying that you, you're never going to amount to anything. I wanted to prove them wrong. I wanted to to be something more. The military was a perfect way for me to do that. It was a few years before I really started understanding that I was part of defending the United States. And it came up on that first enlistment where, you know, you did the oath of enlistment, you're sitting there raising your hand and, you know, you're gonna support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And it, it really hit home to me. And it was something that I was like, wow, I'm really part of something. And I'm the one out there defending everybody's rights. So I had a job, I had, I had a meaning, I had something in my life that I could call that was my own. When I retired from the Marine Corps, uh, it was after 20 years, and now I realize that through the grace of God, I was reunited with my first love. Uh, when we, we were both nine years old, and the very first moment that I laid eyes on her, she was sitting on the front porch playing in the dirt, and I just, she looked up at me, and I, it was just that love at first sight. She's my soulmate. Must have been 31 years I've been in love with her and wanted to be married to her. And now I realize, through the grace of God, I had to go through all of that to actually be with her. And she was the one who uh, really got me going to church, and she was so patient with me. So, you know, reluctantly, I, I ended up going to church, and it really. God started talking to me again. All those battles, all those fights, all the hard times that I had in my life was really setting the stage for exactly this battle that I'm at right now. And that's why I, I really enjoy coaching is because of, I understand what those kids are going through. It's not like something that is foreign to me. There's nothing that they're going through that I haven't been through. And if I'm not giving back, what am I doing? because I never want anybody to go through what I had to go through alone. This is something that isn't for any kind of glory. This isn't for anything that is about me. This is doing what is right. The selfish part of me and the simple way to do this would be to agree with the school and say, yeah, I'll do whatever you want just so I can stay on the football field with those guys. I mean, that's where my heart's at. That's what my calling was. and. The idea of not being able to do that because of something so simple as a prayer and giving thanks is beyond ridiculous to me. But those are the important things we need to fight for. We need to fight for our freedoms. We need to fight for the things that are right in society and for America. I couldn't look myself in the mirror if I just gave up because this got tough, if this was an inconvenience. It ultimately cost me everything. Again, Coach Kennedy would be the first guy to tell you. He's not a major theologian, no, doesn't have the Bible memorized. Uh, uh, he's just a regular guy, and, uh, and he was faithful. And so the update is uh, he's in the Ninth Circuit. It's a very hostile uh, place. The Ninth Circuit's in San Francisco, the Federal Court of Appeals there. And uh, uh, the, in fact, I'll tell you that the night that uh, everybody was wondering, what is he going to do? Uh, is he going to go to a knee? And we knew he was going to go to a knee because he promised God he would, and he did. And uh, the press was all waiting. Um, and he turned the corner to where the press was going to be. He ran into this guy who had been in all those group homes, those foster homes, who had loved him those years in Christ and tried to help him. This guy had driven six hours because he saw in the paper what was happening to be there that night. I mean, Coach Kennedy just started crying. Uh, and... Uh, so he's, he's not exactly the typical guy. You know, he's not the guy we would pick. You know, he's the guy God would pick. Uh, you know, he always picks the, the, the ones that we don't expect. Um, and uh, the Ninth Circuit, very hostile court, issued its ruling uh, a month or so ago. And in their ruling, they said that coaches are not allowed to pray in public if, quote, anyone can see them. Anyone. They didn't say if the kids can see them. They didn't say, because they admitted in the case that the coach had not in any way tried to ever coerce the kids or the students. They said if anyone, a spectator, anyone can see them, 
then that's a violation of the Constitution. And uh, so, needless to say, we're appealing that uh, to the Ninth Circuit, what's called en banc, and then to the Supreme Court if necessary, which is where we knew we would be going with this case. But I just want you to realize that Coach Kennedy's a regular guy, and uh, he's part of this whole culture war of are we willing to be faithful? And well, he's set a great example for the whole country in, uh, in what he's done. The last area, uh, just as an update, would be the military. And there's a lot of things I could talk about. I think last year when I was here, I showed you the video of Oscar Rodriguez, who had been asked in a private retirement ceremony of somebody in the Air Force, um, and asked Oscar to do a little speech during the flag folding ceremony, uh, where he ends by saying, God bless our flag, God bless our troops, God bless America. Well, there was a colonel on that base who didn't want anybody mentioning God on the base. And so while the video cameras were going for the guy's private retirement ceremony, and as Oscar gets up to give this flag-folding speech, uniformed military are grabbing him and throwing him out of the room because he's going to mention God. Um, it's something that we never thought we would see in this country. But uh, that case is now in federal court, and uh, we certainly are optimistic that we're going to win. But we're having to fight all kinds of cases in the military that we didn't used to have to fight. And the most recent one that you might have heard about are the attacks against veterans memorials um, is the, uh, uh, the Bladensburg Peace Cross uh, I think we've got a, a picture of, of the cross. This has been up almost 100 years. It was put up to honor the 41 people in that county who died in World War I, in part from the money of the mothers who lost their sons. And if you look at it, it says honor, val valor, courage. You can see a little bit uh, on the bottom of there, of the, of the monument. Well, the American humanists filed a lawsuit and said, well, you can't have this. This is on government property. You've got to tear it down. And during the oral argument, one of the judges, we had three judges, um, and just to show you, it's, it was a, you know, the, two of the judges were appointed by President Obama and one by President Clinton, okay? Those are the three federal court of appeals judges we had. The decision was split two to one, so it shows that this even crosses beyond Democrat, Republican. But one of the judges asked during the oral argument, if we just cut the arms off the cross, won't that take care of all the offense? To which we answered, you mean deface a National Veterans Memorial that's been up for almost 100 years? Well, we realized we had some uh, lack of understanding, hostility, whatever you want to call it on that court. Well, they just issued their ruling about 10 days ago saying, yes, that Veterans Memorial is unconstitutional and has to come down. Now, if that's true, if that's now the precedent, I mean, there are Veterans Memorials all over the country with crosses and religious symbols that have to come down. And in fact, that Court of Appeals within that Court of Appeals district is Arlington National Cemetery. Okay, there's a 29-foot cross in Arlington National Cemetery, the Cross of Sacrifice. There's a 10-foot cross, the Argonne Cross. There's the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier that says, known but to God. You'd have to sandblast that off. I mean, what these precedents would mean, I mean, you basically would be tearing down crosses all over the landscape in the United States. You know, it makes you think back to Peter Kalkas and his video about what they did in his country when they took the religious symbols down. Uh, but so the military battles are still going, and that's a very important case, the Bladensburg Cross case. You, you can look up on Google anywhere. You can see all kinds of articles beginning to ri uh, be written on this. So the battle's still going. Now, some of you are saying, gosh, I usually don't go to church and get so depressed. Uh, so <laughs> let me tell you the good news. Uh, the good news is we have a model uh, of dealing with this, and it's not a theory. It's something we've been doing for years and it's, it, it's worked, and it, and it is working. And that is, if you look at the normal nonprofit legal organization, what you'll find is what they do is they raise as much money as they can raise. They use that money to hire as many attorneys as they can. They put those attorneys in an office in D.C. or New York or L.A. or somewhere, and they fly them around, and they cover as many of their cases as they can cover. That's not our model. Our model is, I would call, the body of Christ model, which is there's all these people who went to law school because they're people of faith, and they wanted to stand for what was right. And 30 years later, these are the best litigators at some of the best law firms, not only in our country, but really in the world. And they've done honorable work for their clients, but they've never gotten to do a case for the kingdom or for their country. And so we go to them and we sit down and we say, look, if we give you everything you need, are you willing to give your time on one of these cases? Many of them at $1,500 an hour, okay? Best attorneys in the country that, that you know, only money can can get these guys because they want the best. And they say, you know what? I've been waiting 35 years. Sign me up. 
Well, we know what's going to happen when we give them that case. For the first time in their life, all their talent, all their training, all their gifts, everything they've learned is lined up with their faith and their love for their country. They've never felt that before. And it's kind of unfair, but we now know we have them for the rest of their lives as one of our volunteer attorneys. <laughs> and if you were to look at the, and then they're the older partners, so they give cover to the younger attorneys who get to work, and they get to taste what it's like to be able to do work. And so they're like, okay, I've got to be involved. Um, if you were to take the top law firms in the country, you'd find that a significant percentage don't just donate their time. Some of them fight each other over who gets to donate their time in their cases. And the result of that is twofold. One of them, which was my plan, which was getting a lot more bang out of our buck. And uh, sure enough, on an average case, every 10000 we spend, we get 60000 or 50000 donated. It's like a, a five or up to six to one uh, multiplication of God's resources on a typical case because of what they're giving. But what we didn't count on was the win-loss ratio. And that is, if you watch the nonprofit world, win, lose, win, lose, 50-50. If they're really good, maybe they're 60-40. Our win right now for over 17 years in a row has been above 90% in these cases. And I mean, the glory goes to, to, to God. I mean, it's God's favor, but it really is his method. It's his, it's his body. So like if we have a case in, in Montana, our attorney is from Montana. He grew up in Montana. He's from the biggest law firm in Montana. When he goes into court and looks at the judge, that's a former law partner, or maybe they were in elementary school together, but he understands the community. And so when the ACLU guy flies in from New York City, I mean, he's playing an away game. He doesn't understand the community. He's, you know, only the body of Christ could have that, right. where we're everywhere. And, and it's so meaningful to these people to get to give their time on these cases. So it's just such a blessing all the way around. But that's why we win. We should win these cases, right? And we've got the best attorneys in the country. They live in these communities. This country is built on religious freedom. We should be winning 90% of these cases. But the point I'm trying to make here is if we're willing to stand up, we win, this country was built with the right principles. It's a question of whether we're going to let them go. Um, and so I want to show you a picture uh, of what's just happened. Five years ago, when we went national because we were just a Texas group, and this model was working so well, we're winning cases and all this. People said, you got to go national. We prayed, and we felt the Lord telling us, DS. I want to show you just five years later where we are. Okay? So that's good news, bad news, right? I mean, there's cases everywhere. Uh, this stuff is not slowing down, but we're still winning at the same rate, okay? Doesn't matter who's president, okay? Doesn't matter. The politics don't matter because the Constitution is still there and we're still winning. And we got the same model. And so I just want to encourage you because you just don't hear a lot of encouraging news these days. Um, if we're willing to be obedient and stand up, we can win. Now, in addition to all these cases we've got, which I told you is more than ever before, we had this election thing occur. And we were surprised by the result of the election, uh, by the uh, pick of the president. And we thought, gosh, there's probably some new opportunities that are going to be open that would affect religious freedom because of this. And we analyzed it. And sure enough, there are hundreds of different things, which I don't have time to go through. But I'll just give you one example, which is judges. Um, there were, I think at this point, we're up to maybe 160 judicial seats that this president is filling. These are appointments for life, federal judgeships for life that we're talking about. So now to give you an example of some of this, and so, and so we were like, gosh, you know, we've got to be involved in this because this is going to have an impact on our issues more than anything on religious freedom. So we, we went to our board, we said, we got to have extra money, extra people, extra whatever. And, and they gave us a little to get started and said, you, gotta, you need to go raise the rest of it. And we're like, I have another $2 million to go. But What's been happening just from what we've started doing is unbelievable. Um, I mean, two uh, of our employees have been nominated by the president to be federal judges for life, federal district court judges, okay? I mean, these are people who would never turn their back on their faith, who would never turn their back on the Constitution, who 30 years from now, whether it's your kids or your grandkids, that these are the judges they're going to have. I mean, talk about long-term impact, right? 
And that doesn't even include all the volunteer attorneys we have across the country who we know, who are solid people of faith, who are solid people, who have incredible records as far as their attorneys, their acumen, their everything else. They, they, just, they meet all the qualifications, but then they bring that character and that, uh, uh, those beliefs that also make, make it clear that they're never going to turn. Um, so you're not hearing a lot of this good news. <laughs> you hear all the silly squabbles going on up there. But while that's going on, people are sliding into positions for life that are going to affect our country. So I, you know, my point is that this is really our time. There's a, God has opened a window for us. Uh, but it's, you know, it's an opportunity. But it's not a result. It's an opportunity. And so the question is, are we going to be faithful? Are we, or, or five years from now, are we going to look back and go, gosh, God opened this window. I sure wish we'd have done something. Um, and so we feel an urgency to be involved in these things, to get things done, to stand things. You know, I hope I come back a year from now and, you know, uh, sojourn is double because of all the new people who have come to know the Lord. Because of people seeing this window of opportunity that the Lord has laid out for us. Uh, and so my, uh, I want to end with one video uh, and then I'll, I'll say a few things after it will be done. But uh, this is, shows you about persistence and standing up. And this is a, a Jewish synagogue that we've been representing that um, we've now had to have four different lawsuits against them. Why? Because they're just trying to do Yom Kippur. Something that goes way back. And the way they, a, a ceremony that they've used for over 1,100 years that involves uh, a kosher killing of a chicken because the, the atonement, uh, the blood atonement for sin right? That as Christians, we now know Jesus has done, but this is their celebration. And so watch this video and just see what's happening with them. As humans, we respond to many different senses and many different experiences. And Judaism tries to create an entire picture to have everyone get involved and feel and sense the awesomeness of the day. And more than just thinking about it and talking about it, the visualization of actually holding a chicken that is alive and a moment later it is not, this serves as a tremendous reality check beyond any reading. Leading up to the holiest days of the Jewish calendar, that's when this activist group all the way out in Maryland tried to attack this small synagogue in Irvine, California, and they managed to get a temporary restraining order against the synagogue, which is unbelievable. When I found out that the court was not allowing us to practice the Kaparat ritual ceremony, as we have been doing for many years before, right here in Irvine, I was shocked. And I think people need to realize the danger of these groups who are trying to take away our freedom to practice religion, which is one of the fundamental founding blocks of this beautiful nation. When we became aware of the second lawsuit, it was an incredible amount of weight being pressed against a small synagogue here in Irvine. And we were faced with a, a tremendous amount of resources on the part of the animal rights activists. There was an impending deadline and we really didn't have time to, uh, to sit and have meetings about this. We needed action immediately, and First Liberty came in and hit the floor running. When First Liberty learned of the situation that we were facing and, and reached out and contacted us, we agreed to accept their assistance. And within hours, uh, First Liberty had ramped up for what became an overnight marathon in order to have court pleadings filed in the federal case by eight o'clock the next morning. So First Liberty, which originally came in to help us with the federal trial and was had an amazing successful victory, which we are very appreciative of, was then asked to come and help us at the state level, which they did with a whole team of attorneys. We won at the state court trial level, we won at the federal court trial level, but these animal rights activists aren't giving up. They're appealing both of those cases, and we have to be here every step of the way to make sure that they don't win. That we need to make sure that we protect religious freedom for everyone in California. 
they filed an appeal and they're still coming after us. And First Liberty is still standing by Chabad of Irvine. The passion and most importantly the commitment of First Liberty has been the most remarkable thing I've seen in, in many, many years of practice. We'll be back! We'll be back! I think people need to be aware that if they could go after us, they could go after any group that they deem doesn't fit their theology or their philosophy. That could be you, that could be you, that could be anyone. Activist groups like this one are actually trying to reach in to control what happens inside your place of worship, your synagogue, your church, and we need to be there to stop that. They have to be stopped and First Liberty is stopping them. It's such a privilege to represent these guys, but the point I want to make from this is, you know, there's been four different lawsuits now. We've won every one of them so far, uh, but these, they're standing their ground. Uh, so not only can we win, we are winning, okay? And we've been given an opportunity by the Lord. I think most people sense that. Um, and, and I don't think any of us know how long that window is going to be open, but we have an opportunity. So I, my encouragement to you is, if you're not already connected or on our list, I would encourage you, there's a, a card you can fill out out there, please do that, because I want you to know what's going on, I want you to be in prayer about these cases when you see them. I want you to have the information about what freedoms you really have, so you can share that with others, so that not only you, but others can be bolder about sharing their faith, and more people can come to know the Lord. Um, and I want you to know that you can stand just like Coach Kennedy. Yeah, I mean, you can call us if you ever have any situation. Call us, talk to us behind the scenes. We're happy to walk you through what the law is. But I just, I want the body of Christ to take advantage of the opportunity that has been given to be faithful. I don't know what the, I don't know what's going to happen uh, in the future uh, of our country. I mean, I, I don't know. I know we have an opportunity. I don't know what's, whether we're going off the cliff or we're turning this thing around. I only know that if the Lord comes back, I hope he finds all of us standing on the field with a saber instead of sitting in the, in the crowd with a pom-pom. And so let's all get connected. Use us as part of that connection. Uh, we covet your prayers, not only for our cases, but for our staff and the spiritual warfare that happens against, uh, you know, as you can imagine, you know, my family, all of our families in, in our organization. But I just say I love this church. Uh, it's such a privilege uh, to be able to come and speak to you. And uh, just God bless you. Thank you so much.